Yeah. Okay, everybody, uh, we're going to start up our next talk. So, uh, me and Brian actually go back a long ways. Uh, I guess a couple years. We've been on each other for quite some time. Almost five years now, I guess. <laughs> time goes by fast. I'm getting old. Uh, Brian, uh, Brian Baskin here. Uh, I used to work with him at CSC. I'm going to put a little bit of pressure on him here because Brian, as far as I know, is uh, he's the most most accomplished like peer to peer researcher I know. Brian actually, uh, and he has the paperwork to prove it. <laughs> so uh, Brian, ba hey, check this out. I mean, if you work, any network needs to have somebody that knows this kind of stuff. So Brian's gonna just spin a little bit of this. Uh, we say spin a little game to you about how, how you do this. In the audience of one person, I'm the best there is out there. So uh, let's tell you a little bit about myself, because frankly, from most of the stuff I do, people want to know why the hell do I need to listen to the guy standing up there in front of me before they even open their ears. So my name is Brian Baskin, Twitter B. Baskin. I currently am a senior consultant with CMD Labs, a small forensics incident response group out of downtown Baltimore. Uh, previously, it was 10 years with the DOD Cybercrime Center, uh, their training academy as one of the lead technical engineers. Uh, so basically doing all the research on ongoing alerts, threats, uh, forensic responses, and incident response needs for the community, and teaching that back to the military for them to use in their operations. Uh, many years in the forensic field, 10, 15 years or so. Uh, worked with Marcus for you know, six, seven, eight years. Uh, Johnny Long, myself and him, made one of the first hacking classes for the DOD to give at the DOD Cybercom Conference about five years ago, uh, back when they refused to let anybody in the DOD learn how to hack. You, know, you couldn't teach it. That was a taboo subject. We found a way to make it happen, and it kicked off well, and now we're doing it all over the place. Um, I've also written a number of books, the latest of which is Dissecting the Hack, uh, with Jason Street. Some of you guys might know him. Uh, he wrote the fictional side to it. I wrote the revised edition of the non-fiction side. So revised, okay, big differentiator there. Long story. All right. So what we're going to talk about today is mostly peer-to-peer -peer applications of forensics, network trace analysis, uh, basically all the fun stuff that criminals are doing with it today, and from the forensic side of view, the incident response or law enforcement side of view, what are the current issues that we're seeing on a data basis? How do we track it? How do we monitor it? How do we mitigate it? Or just even just bust people using it. So, first of all, how do we get there without talking about the legalities of which? Uh, if you can't read that, it's a nice little uh, picture I actually got from attrition. Uh, I love my records, I just wish they were smaller, more expensive, and illegal to share with my friends. Which is basically how the industry has gone. Uh, taking a great product and just made it even harder to use. And they wonder why people don't like it. Uh, so, overall peer-to-peer -peer world. Now, we have to talk about Kazaa, because Kazaa is the biggest, oldest one of the ones out there that everyone look, laughs at. Um, basically sued into non-existence, for the most part. They start getting major lawsuits against them here in America. They moved their operations, they sold their operations to Australia company. And now the Australia company started getting sued like crazy. Uh, so they're pretty much dead in the water. They tried to maintain a respectable business where you can actually pay and rent stuff from all their service. That sucks. No one uses it. But that was their way of getting away from the court issues and the injunctions against them. Um, so kind of set stage with them into LimeWire, which has hit the news lately that that was the main uh, client for peer-to-peer -peer for a while, made by the guys from Nutella Networks, uh, same guys that made WinApp and all those other apps, that they were charged this year with copyright infringement and inducing others to commit copyright infringement. And then under a court injunction just two months ago, they had to shut down all the services. And then just last week, they said, yeah, we're done. They just pulled it completely. We give up. So LimeWire is dead. Uh, in fact, if you go to the website, you see a nice little legal notice there. The only reason I bring it up is some of you guys are actually using these tools. Like, who cares about Because Who cares about LimeWire? You know, no one uses that anymore, but they do. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later on. And then the big one now, the legalities of BitTorrent. Uh, the two big cases I, I try to focus on now is the Pirate Bay, which God, everyone knows about, where they were sued, tried. In 2009, they lost. They were ordered to pay three and a half million dollar fine and a year in prison each. Uh, they appealed. The appeal just finished up two weeks ago. They lost again. So, poor guys in there. However, some interesting things coming out due to WikiLeaks. 
Uh, there's an unreleased cable that's supposed to be coming out in the next three or four weeks that shows how all the current copyright policies in place in Sweden right now were actually given to them by America through diplomatic channels. Uh, so we told them, here, here's what you should be doing. And they said, okay, we'll do all that stuff. So, and the country themselves that hates America around this, what you see in the corner up there in the upper right hand corner was actually a riot against America in Sweden over the Pirate Bay raid uh, back in 2006. You know, at the time where they were hating America, hating the US copyright organization, hating copyright owners, uh, we were telling the country, this is what you should be doing against your own people. Uh, so that's a little interesting little kink there. Uh, Oink's Pink Palace is a nice one because that was one of the biggest and largest music sites online. The guy was taken down, he was sued. Uh, for many years he was in court for three years. And their claim was he's profiting off of it, he's making all this money. He's like, hey, that money went to infrastructure. I made no profits. I took a little bit here just to buy food, but that's it. Uh, he won. And so he got to keep his money. And that was one of the biggest cases where someone was tried and they won, which is unheard of. And it just kind of goes to show the, the global scape here of no matter where you're at, there is no consistency in the law. Here in America, you're screwed. There, any torrent server any here and anywhere in America, any peer-to-peer -peer server anywhere in America, you're screwed. It's just not going to work. Uh, I know the guys at DOJ, CSIPs, and they work hard against some of these guys. Elite torrents were just shut down three years ago at Virginia. Uh, some of the major sites shut down here on a regular basis. Uh, so they play hard here, but then you go overseas and over the water, a little bit more loose there, depending on where you're at and what country you're in. And you get the whole now debate. Again, I'm going into personal opinion here. I'm here on behalf of my company, but this is my personal opinion. Of recording industry of America and what their wants and needs are versus the entire law enforcement community as a whole. Now, law enforcement people, which is mostly my background from military law enforcement as a contractor helping them out, they love peer-to-peer. -peer. This is great. This is the low-hanging fruit. They can sit there and play whack-a-mole all day with criminals online downloading illicit material. And by that, mostly is child pornography. Now, this is the bad stuff online. It's just hanging out there. You can find the people left and right, seize the machines, take them to court, put them in jail all day long. And they were doing that because the network was there. But now the recording industry says, hey, we don't like that network because people are sharing music on that. So we're going to take the entire network down, which is basically what they're doing now. So you have two sides of the coin here where the network itself is conducive to music being shared, which the RIA hates, but it's also conducive to being illicit material being shared on it, which everyone hates, but we can take advantage of to catch the criminals. And by the mere fact that the RIA has taken out these networks means law enforcement loses. What happens is these criminals who can't find the low-hanging fruit anymore climb higher in the tree. When you lose LimeWire, when you lose Kazaa, you, you're not going to stop. These guys just don't stop. Oh, yeah, they took the client down. I'm just going to stop doing illegal materials. I'm just going to start doing illegal activity. No, they find the next big thing out there, which is usually more encrypted, more secure, harder to detect, and easier for them to use. They just had no clue it even existed because they were using the status quo for so many years. And that's exactly what we found. When LimeWire shut down day one, 24 hours later, all the alternative clients out there, download rates soared. Over 700% increase in downloads to BitTorrent clients and other more secure clients out there within 24 hours after LimeWire shut the door. If people wanted it, they were using LimeWire, but once it shut down, they said, hey, here's another solution. Oh, look, it's more secure. I can hide myself easier in it. And the whole idea there is the more that these networks get shut down, the more they get shut down from all angles, the higher in the tree these guys are going to climb and the harder the job it is on law enforcement to catch the real bad criminals out there. And mostly when I say real bad criminals, I know there's copyright infringement, there's the stuff like that, which, yeah, bad, okay. But I'm talking about real crimes where people are actually getting hurt on a day-to-day -day basis, exploited, hurt, and abused. And those are being basically waylaid. And then you got the really, oh, crap moments where things really do go bad. Uh, for example, some of you guys might realize about a year and a half ago where all the basically schematics and blueprints of Marine One helicopter were leaked out. We didn't know. All we knew was someone was searching on a peer-to-peer -peer network and found them in a network in Iran. 
on Nutella. No one knew it leaked out until they found it actually sitting somewhere else in someone else's country, which just happened to be Iran. Not a good thing. Um, basically, a DOD contractor in the area, this area, had LimeWire installed a machine and accidentally sheared out the entire hard drive. It's kind of hard to do. If you ever use LimeWire, it's hard to do that. It's hard to shear out the entire hard drive. It, it warns you multiple times, you are an idiot. Do you want to be, continue being an idiot? Yes. Okay. And that's how it happened. And it got leaked out. Um, one of my great favorite stories was back in the late 90s where a postal office employee, a supervisor in Illinois somewhere, uh, basically had LimeWire installed on his machine, his work machine, shared out the entire hard drive. Someone else came along, was just searching for documents on the network, and found every single reprimand and write up he did on all his employees in the postal service network. Uh, Decatur, Illinois, if you look it up. So, social security numbers, names, offenses, with great detail of exactly how fast and the wrong way they parked into a parking spot. Um, and that they got laid off, basically fired for these offenses. So this stuff's just floating out there, and people don't know, realize it. Uh, fortunately, because of that, what we have this brand new law that came out, which is gonna be pushed through, which sucks, because uh, it really is gonna do nothing. The HR 1319, Informed P2P User Act, which all it says, and this was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of your tax dollars at work for an act to go through to say, if you are gonna run, if you're gonna develop a peer-to-peer -peer application, you must inform users they're sharing out their hard drive. That's the entirety of the act. That's all it is, is you cannot share the hard drive without warning them. So, good luck with that. Now, the clients themselves. I love Savage. How many of you have you seen a blockbuster? I haven't even seen any of them anymore. It's dead. Good riddance. Uh, Kazaa, yes, still in use. Uh, the official client, who cares? No one cares about that anymore. What they found these alternative clients like Kazaa Light and Kazaa Resurrection, uh, which are basically their own separate networks, they took the DLLs out of the original Kazaa client. They couldn't reverse engineer them. They could reverse most of the protocol information itself. But they just, when they couldn't reverse it, they just stole the DLLs. They saw the lookups, they saw the calls, they just took the calls and just integrated into their own client. It's like, okay, we don't need to reverse engineer, we'll just steal their makeup. And they built their own network out of it. So the Kazal Light and Resurrection are those. Um, but they are very heavily looked upon by law enforcement and the recording machine groups. So, yeah, no one really takes it seriously anymore. LimeWire, no one really cared anymore either, even though it shut down. Uh, one week after they shut down, a brand new edition came out, the LimeWire Pirate Edition, which is, that's their logo on the right-hand corner. So YouTube video is great, with a theme from Lazy Town, awesome. That's real talent right there. Uh, which was great because they actually took a source code from LimeWire from years ago, put it out open, and enabled all the features you just have to pay for. So they... Not only, okay, for, for a typical LimeWire user, oh, they lost a client, oh, too bad. Oh, here's a new one with all the stuff I, I didn't have to pay for now. So they made out in that effect. Uh, this did not hurt anyone at all. It actually made it better for the criminals to use by them shutting down the network, as usual. Uh, historically, it's the number one network we've seen for child pornography cases. Uh, some of the major operations out there, Operation Pure Play, Operation Pure Precision. Uh, there's guys out in Wyoming. I figure because it's so cold, they got nothing else to do. They are like the number one developers on applications to search for CP on the, on the peer to peer. Um, they were all just balled up recently. There's a company called TLS, TLO, in Florida, where if you guys never heard of them, there's one guy called Hank Asher. Every data mining application that the government uses, he, he developed. He is like the data mining guy, God of the world. Uh, and he just has a penchant for people doing illegal stuff on the internet. So he just writes data mining applications. He has terabytes, petabytes of databases that he gives out to law enforcement. And so he just balled up these entire groups of law enforcement guys and said, you're going to work for me now. Let's develop the stuff. Let's catch these guys. So they're all private. They're out and doing the stuff. And they keep it very secret. Um, but yeah, they, they are definitely burdened by all these networks being taken down. But that's their job to get around it. And for the most part, too, all this stuff is actually being transmitted in the wire. Uh, for Kazaa and LimeWire itself, and you see here is a Kazaa catcher, where it's just out there. 
Um, all the streams themselves are going from just a SHA-1 value of the file itself. You, when you advertise something, you say, here's the file name, here's a SHA-1 value. The other client says, okay, I want that SHA-1. And he says, okay, HTTP 200, okay, here's your data. Uh, and that's all it is, just a straight data dump, carve it out, and you're done. As an admin, it's great because you can just look at what people are downloading. If you liked it, just carve it out and watch it yourself. Uh, no effort involved. I didn't say that. Now, bit to ourself, this is mostly what we talk about because this is the number one client most people use today. And I was trying to find some ways of how do you measure how popular something is. You can't go by downloads per day because that's just useless. No one really looks at that. Um, this last month, new stats came out over traffic usage, bandwidth usage globally, uh, upstream and downstream traffic. And in the United States, 53% of all upstream traffic from peers to the backbone is BitTorrent related. Right, so every byte you count on the internet, leaving from a peer to the network, is BitTorrent, 53% of it. That's actually one of the lowest amounts in the world. China is about 64%, and South America is the highest of 73%. So basically, 73%, basically two thirds or uh, three quarters of all data flying across the network down there is BitTorrent. I mean, that just shows you massitude of, of data being flowing around on a daily basis. So a lot of the stuff I talked to, I, I have some basics. I'm going to run through some stuff because I know we're already starting late and going late and it's getting dark outside. I'm tired. I need some Four loco to kind of keep going here. We ran out of coffee and it's too early for beer, but uh, Four loco seems a nice combination of solution there. Sites themselves, Pirate Bay, BT Junkie, ISO Hunt, if you guys didn't know what these already do now. Pirate Bay is the biggest one. BT Junkie I love because it's an aggregator site. Uh, Diminoid Pirate Bay themselves are singular sites. They're, they run their own tracker for most cases. They work independently, they're on their own. Sites like BT Junkie go to all these other sites, dozens of them, and just collect them all together. So when you go there, you get tap it once and you can hit five different sites, a dozen different sites, 20 different sites simultaneously. Uh, it's great legal ones. I have to separate out because there's really none out there. Uh, Linux Tracker. Yeah, how many of you guys use that excuse? I was downloading Linux ISOs. Bullshit. The, the, someone had, was it? Actually, at DEF CON, someone did that study of how percentage of people who used it to actually do Linux stuff, and it was like 4%. That's nothing. All right, it's illegal. You guys know what's going on in there. And of course, legaltorrents.com, one of the least visited sites on the internet. Um, it's all common media stuff that. Yeah. Private sites I love. Here are the sites because most of it is segregated out by content. So you don't have just a general catch-all category here. You've got individual sites that pertain to specific types of content for their files. Bid me for educational material, which is documentaries, history channel, HGTV, uh, Discovery Channel, college textbooks. That's all they care about is anything educational. They actually have a very high attendance rate. I don't know why, but that's a great site for a lot of people. Uh, music, TV, and so forth. But there are hundreds and hundreds of these private ser servers out there. Uh, to get on them, you must register for an account. But you don't get an account because most of them have very closed registration periods. So you must be invited in by someone else who's already on the site. And if you piss off the site, you lose your account. And the person who invited you loses their account. So there's a lot of circle of trust involved in that, which I'll talk about a little bit more later on. Uh, just because I like to give statistics of what's out there right now, uh, this is stuff that most people just know, of, you know is what's popular, but as of right now, this is the Pirate Bay Top 100. So as of last night, uh, the Big Bang Theory Season 4 Episode 10 was posted that day and already had Seasons and Leachers uh, 50,000 people involved in the network. So if you look at the right hand side, you see the columns SC and LE. Those are seeders and leechers. Uh, basically just people inside the network. Seeders are people who have already downloaded the whole thing, are just hanging around to share it out to other people. But 50,000 people inside of that. Vampire Diaries, 40,000, Fringe, Inception, and so forth. A lot of movies. Down at the bottom, Call of Duty Black Ops. 13,000 people. So that's the only game in the, that made the list. 
Now that's from the Pirate Bay itself. When you look at what I mentioned BT Junk, it's an aggregator site. It goes to all the sites that combines the stats together. So here's what BT Junkie saw. Uh, inception number one with 240,000 people. So it didn't look at one single site, it looked at dozens of sites of uh, people sharing the exact same file and culled them together. So it found 155,000 people seeding and 90,000 people leeching it out, followed by Sources of Printer, Scott Pilgrim, also movie, Robin Hood, and then, God, give me the Greek, Easy A, stupid movies. Uh, Beyond the Clouds, never heard of that. And the cop, oof. all right, horrible stuff on there. Yes, people have no taste on the internet. Just, if you didn't realize that, you do now. Um, just kind of showing, and, and to a lot of people I talk to, to put it in their, high, their minds of how large this is. This is 240,000 people at a one period of time. Knowing that every second that goes by, someone's dropping out and someone else is joining in. So constant flow in millions and millions of people. And then when you look at the bandwidth itself, and this, this is actually a private site to talk about uh, the top stuff. Their top file, what, top thing recently was Fallout New Vegas and the Call of Duty Black Ops. But then they also break it down by bandwidth. So their top bandwidth item was Mass Effect 2, the PC rip, which contributed to 133 terabytes of data flow. That's a lot. So on a one private site, uh, just all they do is games. That's all this one site does. 133 terabytes of data came across that private site for that game. That doesn't include all the public sites where people are actually getting it as well. And the biggest thing here is obviously large files, collections of files, seasons of files. For some ungodly reason, people are downloading the complete series of Beverly Hills 90210. Seinfeld, my God, get a life. But yes, the 100 gigabytes, 11 people are sharing out 100 gigabytes of 90210 seasons. To go along that thread, a recent uh, study came out, what is the biggest things we've seen so far? Uh, I have to disagree with some of these things, but here's what they found. The largest torrent they found to date was the 2010 World Cup collection which are 746 gigabytes in size. That's big. Um, Jason Scott, text files on Twitter, uh, he put his GeoCities archive up. That is currently sitting at 640 gigabytes. He thought he was the biggest for a while and so did everyone else. Uh, but what actually is the biggest was something no one has ever heard of in the world. The... Uh -oh. Ooh. I just broke something. Um, my stuff Sweet. looks like it's all right. is this running. I don't think it's my stuff. This is still alive. We blew a circuit, I believe. Does anyone here know anything about computers? Electricity. I can't see what the power button is on here. It has power. I have the power button back there. Let's just reset it. Just right. All right, well, we're figuring that out. I can read off my screen. The <laughs> line for Blues Brothers is maybe we blew a fuse. No, man, those lights are out of the room. All right, so, so while we're taking a look at that, just to run some things for you, uh, the, here it is coming back on. Wow, Adrian, you're the man. You're the one that passed off. You did it. Don't start that shit. <laughs> What can you love, man? All right. The, what no one's ever heard of is Tuhu. Music collection. How many of you guys ever heard of that? Wow. We've got some serious otakus here. That is a Japanese game collection of just weirdest shit you ever see online. But they actually... Great. Apparently it is because there's an 800 gigabyte collection of music out there that is ongoing on a constant basis. Do you have it? Oh god, don't reach feedback. <laughs> yes, 800 gigabytes, and that grows on a regular basis. Uh, so, yeah, there's some weird stuff out there. The largest one on the single track that they found so far was Heroes 3 Season 3, season three Episode 1, uh, which had a 444,000 people. Now, I showed you some bigger ones earlier, like Exception was 240,000, but that was culled through multiple sites, all pulled together. This was from Pirate Bay. This is one single tracker, one single server, 
144,000 people. Uh, the oldest one out there is the Matrix ASCII. You guys seen it? They read the entire Matrix movie in ASCII code. It's great. It's actually like the movie, but they change the graphics. So like you actually see the, the faces are made of, of characters. It's a cool thing. That's actually been hosted continuously since 2003. Uh, and so far, this is actually old because I'm sure it's a lot more now, the most transferred data ever for a single game or application was StarCraft II. It's 15.77 petabytes. I like that secret. Petabytes, petabytes, petabytes. That's a thousand terabytes. It's a thousand gigabytes. Which is what? Petabyte is what? One million gigabytes? I don't know, my math sucks. It's some ungodly number. And that game came out, what, just this year, didn't it? Yeah, July. July. So in a period of five months, 16 petabytes of data over one game. Holy shit, that's a lot of stuff. Who's paying for that? Not me. All right, so how do, we, how do these, these, these clients actually talk together? And, and what we see on our end is to track people, who, who they talk to on a regular basis, uh, Basically, like these companies like Media Century and SafeNet, who actually go out there and track people down, I like to know how they're doing that, so that we can try to maybe avoid that or do it ourselves uh, to catch people. So when you go out to the internet and you look for a file you want, you find something you want to download, you get a file. You get these torrent files. All right. This is basically a text file. If you never take a look at it, it's great. Crack it open. Open up a notepad. Uh, what it is is just includes a URL to a tracker which is a server out in the internet that just tracks what people are inside or sharing what file, uh, when it was created, what the file names are, and what client was used to actually create that torrent file in the first place. So you can tell if it's a Linux, Mac, Windows person, whatever. But the entire file itself and the network itself is identified by SHA-1 value. Uh, if you're not familiar with hashes, they take all the data, they feed it through the algorithm, spits out a 16-byte, 24-byte SHA-1 value. Um, give you an example of that. One million gigabytes. Wow. Someone just tweeted me. Uh, if you look at it itself, this is what you see, which is kind of give it a go. It's in its own special format. The guy who made BitTorrent, Bram Cohen, is a genius. Of course, he's got Asperger's syndrome. He's like one of those weird, just genius off the wall guys. He wrote the application, he wrote the protocol, he wrote the data structure, probably all in one night. Right? So, <laughs> His issue was, how do I put databases worth of data into a text file? And this is what he came up with, uh, which basically you read this as D dictionary, eight. Okay, you're looking for a field that's eight characters long. So it counts out eight characters, it sees the word announce. All right, 45 characters long. Looking for a value that's 45 characters long. Counts them out, there's my value, it's a URL. You know, if any of you guys are old school, the C null terminator versus Pascal number term, number defined variables. This is all number defined variable stuff. Um, and you notice the odd thing here too is the second tracker they list in there is a dot onion address. You guys know what that is, right? Tor. Is Tor supposed to be used for peer to peer? God, they hate it when you do that stuff. They hate it. People do it. But God, I hate it. Do not use it for peer-to-peer -peer people. All right. It just kills the network. Though in this case, they're using it for the tracker purposes. While that still probably goes suck the film out, it's not like it's necessarily right. transferring through Tor. It's not the data itself going through Tor. It's going to be the regular beaconing out to a database on a regular basis. Uh, so yeah, this is a server sitting out in the dark net uh, that is just collecting stuff and, and tracking all the peers in there. And then the file name itself, which was the Venture Brothers, season four, episode 15. Venture Brothers people, anyone? Great show. So in this file itself, there's a certain portion that's hashed and not hashed. Uh, anything from that word info down is the hash area. They take that and that's just one value. The cool thing about that is everything before that is not hashed. Okay, that was stupid. Everything before that, you can edit to your life's content. You can do anything you want in that section and no one will care. But if you edit something down in that hash zone, you change the hash value, which means no one can connect to you because you're in your own network at that point. You are now have a different hash value than everyone else. You're not going to talk. But above that, you can do anything you want. 
So that's where BT Junkie comes in. They can add more trackers. They can add comments. You can put hidden messages in there. You have that little comment field. You can do lots of stuff inside this file and share it with people, and no one would know. To look at it. And you can actually break it out. If you break it out logically, this is what it looks like. Kind of easier to read. Um, the odd, odd thing here is that you take the creation date, which is the number of seconds since 1970, Unix time. Uh, and this was November 10, 2009. Kind of odd, because that tells me this guy's machine was one exactly one year off in his date time. So, forensic standpoint, that's that's really cool to me. But uh, it shows it actually was uploaded 10 November 2010. His machine was off by one year. So you see the files in there, you see the size of them, you see all that good stuff. However, that's going away. No one cares about torrent files anymore. They're dead. The issue with torrent files was when the Pirate Bay got taken down, you couldn't get on there to download these files. Where were you supposed to get torrent files from if the files, if the server's down? So they already had a solution in place called magnet links. Uh, anyone who's used eDonkey 2000 is quite familiar with e magnet links. These came about more popularly because of the Pirate Bay being taken down. When the site went down, people were like, oh crap, where am I going to get my stuff now? Hey, I don't need it anymore. We'll just share magnet links. All I have to do is just post this on the website somewhere, or the Twitter, or in the email, or anywhere else, and you have all the details you need. Because for a client to join a network, all they need is a SHA-1 value, and that's it. So, and, and the tracker that they're supposed to connect to. So what this magnet link here that shows in the middle is here's a SHA-1 value, here's the URL of the tracker, and for giggles, here's the display name. Here's Windows 7, the name of the file you're downloading. So you can just take this value, copy paste it to someone else, they copy it into the client, they're good to go. So we don't need Tor files anymore. So all these new mechanisms come out now to replace centralization in the network. We need web servers to host the torrents. Not anymore, we got magnet files. Okay, we still need trackers. We still need someone out there to track all the people inside these networks so we know who to connect to. Well, yeah, they got away with that too. So because of these sites actually being taken down, uh, a lot of them being moved to Ukraine, a lot being moved to Romania, uh, but now Ukraine is now prosecuting hard. State Department's got involved out there to help the law enforcement prosecute the, these torrent solvers being set up out there. So what solution do we have? And what they use now, some called the distributed hash tables, DHT, which means I don't want to track anymore. Let's get rid of the servers. Let's use a completely peer-to-peer -peer solution in place here. Uh, in a nutshell, you have to have a database somewhere on the internet that says these are the IP addresses associated with this file, and so you can join in a swarm. That way, when I join, that database sends me a list of IP addresses. I connect to them and make my data connections. So where do we put that if not on a dedicated server? Well, you take a random person on the internet and just give it to him, which is basically what they did. So any BitTorrent client out there running a BitTorrent application can become a tracker invisibly behind the scenes without any you know, other knowledge. And what it basically does is it takes a SHA-1 of that file, and then it takes your client ID, which is the name of your client, the version number, and some random digits, SHA-1's that, and whoever client is the closest to that file, you're the lucky guy. You get it. And then as me joining the network, I basically go round robin. I uh, hit up, I send a request out, the guy says, nope, not me, I'm nowhere close to that. He sends off to someone else. The other guy says, nope, not me either. And it just keeps going around the network until it finds the person who is the tracker for that file. Um, based basically on how close your hash values are. This is math. I know it's hard. It's, it's late in the day, so I'm not going to go through this. And it's XOR math too, your favorite kind, I know. So this is basically it. They take the, the, the value of SHA-1, break it into binary, do XOR math on it, and whatever the closest by distance through an XOR algorithm is to the data is the tracker. Now, if you go online, offline, if you close your client out and you drop off face of the earth, it takes a database with you. It's done. 
but then it gives it to someone else. There's backups out there, it just reduplicates it to the next guy who has close to SHA-1 value. So there's a constant database floating through the network. So you don't need centralized servers anymore. You don't need centralized machines anymore. It is completely just sitting out there on the internet. Um, the bad thing about this and why some sites don't use that any right now is because they cannot enforce ratios. You go to some of these private sites, they like ratios, upload to download ratios. If you upload a gigabyte, you must, if you download a gigabyte, then you really should upload at least one gigabyte back to other people. If you don't, we're gonna kick your ass off. If you upload two gigabytes for that, down, for that one gigabyte, you're great. Uh, so they like that ratio in play to keep good people on the site. With DHT, there's no tracker. The tracker keeps track of those ratios. You lose that server, you lose that capability, so all your private sites out there don't use this. They can't. They still rely on trackers. But even now, we're seeing clients, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I just have a quick question. You, you said that um, everyone holds, each computer holds a different hash of, yeah. you, at least you become the server, right? Yes. So when the network of, network of the person that's coming into, like their internet connection, wouldn't that be taxed the bandwidth if it was, if everybody tried to connect to this one person? It would. Question for the, for the internet is, yes, your machine gets hashed, and would attack your bandwidth for all the people querying your box to get that data. And, and really, the data, there's not that much data flow. It's just like small packets of just text of IP addresses. And also, uh, in, in the uh, Cadimlium network, my understanding is where they have, they have it spread out to where there's more than one person that has that entry. Yeah. And you don't have to actually switch all the way around the entire circle. There's, I don't know if it's used like a binary search tree or what exactly, but this node might know, well, I know of these other nodes that are closer to that number you're looking for. Why don't you check with them? And they say, well, I'm not it either. So this one over here is a little bit closer. So each time you like maybe half the distance. So within a couple jumps, you have your file and there's multiple people who have it. And if the machine is shut down gracefully, like Brian was saying, it says, um, I'm going bye-bye. Can someone else take care of my duties for this? But even if it doesn't, there's still hopefully some of us, at least for a popular file, that will still have duplication. So I simplified it greatly on the, on the slides here. It gets ugly. They're, they're, it oh, gets Kadimlia and the KRAD and some of these different protocols out there. Oh, God, it hurts to read. Papers read, written by academics. Yes. Uh, don't. Go, go sleep with that stuff. Um, and what we're seeing now is that even all these dedicated clients that are completely decentralized. They work completely decentralized. Tripler is a new one that just came out. Um, and here's an example here where all the discovery, the content discovery, and all the peer commu communication is done decentralized using peer-to-peer. -peer. So it finds other clients who are sharing out archives, and they're sharing out their list of files, and they're sharing out other peers. So without going to a tracker, without going to DHT, well, using solely DHT, without going to a website, you could search for content, download it, and operate completely inside a decentralized network. Right, so there is, the whole idea here is law enforcement and the government and copyright owners can't go and just CND a site, take down a site and, and just shut it down. It's impossible now. It's completely, completely decentralized. Uh, the one thing about Triple Door, it leaves a very fr messy forensic mess. Because as you're browsing through all the files out there, it just goes and downloads all the torrent files for you. Even though you're not actually engaging in the network, it goes ahead and downloads the files just to have them ready. And so you have these big mass structures of these just sitting on your hard drive. And then, well, I love it because who's to prove intent here? Like, how do I know you didn't click on that? It's on your hard drive. You know, I love playing that game. So you find your peers, you find your, your data. How does the data actually crow across the network? And I'm not going to go too deep into this because it gets really deep again. This is that Bram Cohen stuff, very genius. He wrote his own data communication protocol called PWP Peer Wire Protocol, uh, which is a, just a mess. If you open a Wireshark, Wireshark has a dissector for PWP. You just search for BitTorrent. And his idea is, we'll, we'll come up with a packet design where 14 or so different unique messages can be sent of, I want this piece. I have this piece. I'm not interested in that piece, but I do want that piece. 
who wants this piece? Now, this is, that's data of, of, that goes back and forth. And even worse, you can combine more than one message per packet. So one single packet can have, I think, up to four different unique messages in it that you have to carve in between and, and evaluate because it's a mess. Automatically, through software, it's great. It's efficient. They can work with that. Through Wireshark, ugh. And what they then use is they take the file, they break it down to these pieces. So you have a one gigabyte file. You got this movie you're downloading. It's one gigabyte. I say movie, really, I'm not condoning copyright infringement, I just use an example. So one megabyte chunk pieces of data. It then breaks those down to 16 kilobyte blocks of data. And those 16 kilobyte blocks are then broken down into usually 4K chunks, which are sent one packet at a time. Now what I like to do, I like strip data. I like to sniff traffic, strip data out, see what I can find. It's fun to do that. Uh, the problem with that then is you're looking for individual pieces of data. Everything in BitTorrent is downloaded not in sequential order, it's randomized. You know, when it saves data to a hard drive, it's completely randomized in this way. Uh, so you're looking for basically four kilobyte chunks at a time looking at the index, looking at the piece number, finding the offset, opening a file on your hard drive, copying the data to that file, four kilobytes at a time for a gigabyte file. This is the old way of doing this, when we had to do actual network data analysis of BitTorrent traffic. It was ugly. Spent hours and hours and hours and hours doing this. Luckily, one guy's new Pearl. Um, so it can be done. The worst part of that too is to actually find the data. When you see the data flowing across the network, all you see is data. You don't see, oh, this is the data for this movie. It's just data. So you have to trace back to all the original handshakes between the clients to figure out what SHA-1 they're passing back and forth. And then when you have a client who's downloading 20 files simultaneously, it gets ugly. Uh, so yes, we have, we have carved it manually. It's godly ugly. Uh, it took me about five or so hours to do a one megabyte file. So with these gigabyte files, I estimate it probably be about 10,000 man hours to do a gigabyte. Um, so can be done, not pretty. Luckily, some automated tools that we use out there. Um, just so you know it's out there and it's being used against you, there's a tool that the FBI uses called Cool Miner. Uh, you guys have heard of Carnivore from the old days? Carnivore is basically three different applications that worked in tandem to scout, collect, package information, and export it out. Uh, this is the export tool, Cool Miner. So they capture PCAPs, it takes PCAPs, it spits out data. It spits out full IRC transcripts in real time, I, uh, IM chats, and it does BitTorrent files. It says, hey, here's the files in play, just dumps them on the hard drive. It takes a few hours to turn and burn through it, but it does it. Uh, not many tools can do that. Access Data has a tool that they bought from Raytheon called Silent Runner. They claim can do it, but they refuse to show me. I like Access Data, but I, I want to see this tool in operation. So until then, I'm kind of just putting that question mark there. Uh, they also want 30 grand per seat to use it. So obviously, I haven't tried it yet. And no, you can't find it on BitTorrent. I tried. <laughs> no, Trevor. No. Although you can find some old copies of InCase. Did not go there. All right, so kind of getting near the end of this. I'm, I'm going to breeze through some of the forensic stuff, talk about some of the cool stuff a little bit after that, of you know anti-forensics and some of the, the cool tricks we use to, we can play. Um, three major clients we, we look at. The first one I really don't look at much anymore, the mainline. Uh, basically off the mainline artery, Bram Cohen wrote the program, wrote the application, wrote the protocols. He wrote his own application in Python, open source. So when he came out with a new genius idea, he developed it, wrote it to the application, and put it out to the world. Everyone else who's writing clients, they saw that update, hey, it's a great idea, we'll copy it and put it in our client. That was how it worked. So they called it the main line, because everything fed from it. Um, that's no longer in use. It's 5.3, it's the oldest version, it's probably about 2 or 3 years old now. But it's the oldest official version for Mac and Linux. After that, they said, screw you guys, we're going Windows. Um, uTorrent, MicroTorrent, however you want to call it, that is the best, in my opinion, one of the best clients out there. Easy, simple, small, easy to use. 
bitch on bought them out. They say, we love you clients so much, we're going to buy you. And we're just going to rebrand it as our company. So uTorrent out there exists, and they have a separate product called BitTorrent, which is the exact same software in 99% of the ways. Um, does it get confusing yet? So we'll talk about those. And then Views, formerly known as Azurius, uh, which is his own bag of gravy. Uh, completely segregated off, they have their own developers, but they are the geniuses, they are the smart guys. Their discussion boards of the new protocols they're figuring out, Leaps ahead of everyone else in the, in the field. So let's get past the BitTorrent stuff. Uh, the new ones I want to talk about, some of the main things here is when you download something and you have a torrent file that you download, that is being stored on your hard drive. And it stores it all into your user profile folder. So every dot torrent file you download, even if you complete the transaction, even if you don't even download the, the actual data itself, you just download the torrent file, it's stored on your hard drive in that data. So the interesting thing about this too is it stores it with the original file name when you download it and it keeps it there forever. So it's kind of funny you see some, some of these machines that we take a look at where it's years and years and years of downloads, thousands and thousands, most of them porn related. And weird because you can see their, their fetishes change over time. It gets weird. So one year they're really into this, and the next year, ooh, they just completely changed 180 on that. Uh, did not see that one coming. But it stores it forever, and people just don't realize it. It's just sitting on the hard drive. Uh, it also stores some great details of where the information is kept in there. So for example, there's a settings for uTorrent that stores their last download location, uh, what ports they listen on, how many times they've been run, and how long it's been running for in seconds. So you could tell this client's been running for years on end versus a week just by looking at the number of seconds it's been running for. And yes, didn't you guys know those weekly cable on Justin Bieber's international itinerary? I'm sure it's in there somewhere. Now, when BitTorrent bought out uTorrent, they kept the client. They didn't touch it, but they added something. They added something called BTDNA. Uh, which was a nice little Windows service that they install on your machine automatically without your consent that helps you use the ISP bandwidth kindly. So what it does is instead of going out to the internet and looking for peers immediately, it looks locally first. If you're a Comcast user, what BTDNA will do is contact Comcast and look for other Comcast IP addresses first before going out to the internet. That way you're downloading from other people inside the local ISP network. Saves them money. It's good for them. Higher speeds, all that good stuff. Uh, the bad thing about it though, is it installs as a service and it doesn't hold itself to just BitTorrent. It does it for all data on your machine. So all protocols are now being routed through the service who looks for local machines first. And then you got a question, what is it beaconing out to Comcast? when it does that search. Uh, so there's a nice little reverse analysis done. I got the URL up there, um, which you can email me. I'll give you a copy of these slides if you want, where they actually take a look at it. How does this actually work? This is evil. This is bad. It's out there. And it's not going away. So people who download the official BitTorrent client have it in their system. Uh, UTorrent client does not. Views itself. Views is nice, completely Java-based, works on all the major OSs. A uh, very aggressive development team. What do you mean by that? Encryption. Back in 2000, late 2006, early 2007, the very first shutdown was taking place. A ISP in Canada saw too much BitTorrent traffic going across its network. So they just said, okay, we're stopping it. It looks for BitTorrent packets and just resets them. If it sees BitTorrent in the packet header, which is right there plain as day, it sends back a reset packet and closes connection out. People getting pissed. How dare you stop me from downloading illegal files? You know, so the obvious solution in place was encryption. We have to encrypt this data. How do we do that? Well, Bram Cohen's like, yeah, I don't want to go down that road. That's kind of ew. Ooh, that's bad. These guys are like, screw that. Within a week, they had their own encryption algorithm written together. They threw it in place. It was it was done. 
So in a week it was done, it was in place, people were using it, they forced upload, upload, updates out, uh, and it was in, in wide use. And then about two months later, Brad Cohen was like, yeah, maybe I should do encryption, I'll do my own. So the two are not compatible. Um, so these guys are very aggressive, they are very smart, they get the major stuff out there. When there's a need, they get it written, they get implemented quick before it becomes an issue. However, it's usually not compatible with a lot of other clients out there when they do it. Um, but it's a great client, I've given credit. And they try to get legit. They now have their own service, media delivery service. We actually buy, rent movies through that. Um, the cool things about here, basically from a forensic standpoint, is again, all your torrent files are kept on the hard drive. What it actually has is an active folder. So anything you're currently downloading right now, you're currently involved in either a Cedar or a Leecher, it stores inside one folder, renames it to the SHA-1 value, so you can't see Windows 7.torrent, it just shows SHA-1.torrent, uh, stores that in a folder. And then when you're done, it moves it to another folder called Torrents. And that's kept forever. Doesn't delete anything ever out of there. And again, you go back years and years and years, and you find some stuff you download and you're kind of scared about. You might want to delete to hide from your spouse. Um, so this stuff is, is probably stored on there. The other weird thing I found, I don't know exactly why it does this, but every time the Views client reaches out to the internet to make a connection, it grabs its egress net block. So it grabs the IP address net block of its outgoing connection and stores it in a configuration file. Why? I, I can't tell you. But it's really cool stuff because you know exactly when someone is connecting through a Verizon network. You know when they're connecting through work if they're on a laptop versus a Starwood Suites Hotel network, versus a Starbucks, versus Barnes & Noble. So by looking at that, I can see this, is, this person connected through 151.196 IP address to the internet, coming from a Verizon net block. So when you look at the laptop, we can see, oh yeah, this person last connected Starbucks, McDonald's, whatever. Um, why it's being stored, we don't know, but hey, it's good stuff. And just for cool giggles, they also keep running totals of how many things you've totally downloaded overall, how much data you've downloaded in bytes and uploaded, and how long you've been up running in seconds. This does not have anything to do with anything. They just like to put it, they just like to store it for nothing. So you have a file on your hard drive that says you've downloaded six million files totaling six petabytes of data. All right. So that's the basic for side. So what, what do we do to, to bypass and get around this? So how are the criminals actually operating to hide themselves on the internet from detection? How are people downloading stuff inside their own work networks without work being able to determine that they're using BitTorrent traffic in the first place? Obviously, you, you can't see the cat, so it must be working. Uh, Co-location is the, the, the new big thing. So obviously, if you go out and you download BitTorrent data, that is clear as day in network packets. You see the BitTorrent stuff. Uh, even encrypted, you see little telltale signs that the traffic is in place. Uh, there's a tool out there called Sandvine. Sandvine was a tool in place uh, used by Comcast when they started shutting down BitTorrent traffic about two years ago. Uh, Sandvine is used by tons and tons of companies. That's their job is to block network connect connections. Uh, so what these guys realize is, hey, let's just not use BitTorrent. Let's not use BitTorrent from server to my machine. Let's use the BitTorrent stuff. Let's keep it up there in the cloud. So it basically, there's a co-location server out there that does the BitTorrenting for you. You give it the torrent file, it downloads it, it stores it on the hard drive, and then you download it using regular HTTP or FTP. So for a network administrator who's looking at network logs, you don't see BitTorrent, you just see an HTTPS, an FTP, or an SFTP connection being aided to an IP address. How many of you guys even look in detail at that stuff? Probably nothing. If you're looking for peer-to-peer, -peer, you're going to look for peer-to-peer. -peer. If it's not peer-to-peer, -peer, you don't care. All right, so sites out there like Peer Harbor, you pay a monthly rate. They have very fast bandwidth, and they just download it for you, and you get it from them when you're ready. Uh, other ones out, there's lots of services like that, but we also see a lot of VPN services in play. VPN directly for pirate or BitTorrent traffic. Um, Pirate Bay, God, they, their name is everywhere. Pirate Beyond, the, the political party, runs the site, everything's hosted there. Uh, 
when Pirate Bay was raided back in 2006, they were housed in the same data center as the political party, Pirate Bay, in Sweden. Actually, if you go out to YouTube and look for Pirate Bay raid, you can see the surveillance camera footage of the responders raiding the data center. They recorded all the surveillance camera put on YouTube. It's awesome. Um, so the Pirate Bay guys are really, really big on avoiding police and avoiding detection. So they started their own service, a v they started their own VPN service called iPredator. Uh, basically in Sweden they passed a law in 2009, October, called the iPred, the Intellectual Property Rights Enforcement Directive, that says that all ISPs must maintain logs for X number of days, and if they are maintained, they must be given to police upon request immediately. Okay, that's kind of scary stuff privacy-wise. So what iPredator does is their VPN services say, hey, we don't keep logs. There are no logs here at all. So police can come knocking all they want, we got nothing to give them. And they run a service, and they're still running, that you can traffic your data through them. They're do, it runs through them and they keep no logs at all of who you connect to. They're just one of many services to do that. Um, and then just the other week we had this huge DHS takedown, So you guys might be aware of, where 82 domains were basically taken down by Department of Homeland Services ICE. Immigrations and Customs Enforcement. Uh, what they did was basically went to the DNS records and redirected all DNS queries for those domain names to an ICE server. They had this big thing up there, hey, this domain's been seized. We now control it. Yeah, they can do that. Uh, basically, Customs and Immigration, anything coming in this country or out of the country, they control. So they're looking mostly as far as counterfeit goods guest bags, you know, sunglasses, all this BS stuff. Counterfeit sunglasses being sold or being shipped here into America and being sold on websites, they take an interest in that. So when a website goes up here in America that sells counterfeit brand, brand name goods, they shut it down. Uh, what we found in that was though they took a few different torrent sites down that really had nothing to do with their jurisdiction. I'm sure that's going to come out later on, but as soon as they determine, they'll find some way to justify it. Uh, but right now, it's really just really no clue. Well, that just happened in late November, and that got a lot of people up in the air. It's like, wow, this is really bad. How can, how can this happen? How can ICANN, the ICANN, allow this to happen? To just let a U.S. law enforcement company come in and just take down domain names everywhere, anywhere they want. So, the guys behind Pirate Bay, Say, you know what, we're going to stand up against this. We're going to create a whole new DNS system, a peer-to-peer -peer DNS system. Now, these solutions were already in place. There's already been peer-to-peer -peer DNS for years. No one uses it. No one cares. There was never a motivator to use these services before in the past. Uh, Peter Sunday from Pirate Bay, he's like, you know what, this is going to be my, I'm going to, I'm going to take issue with this. I'm going to do this. So he started a rally. He's like, we're going to put this out there. So dot P2P. That was the site he set up, and now P2P DNS at BayWars.com. Uh, basically, you can track the progress of it. They're looking through all the solutions. There's like four different applications out there right now, open source for peer to peer DNS, and they're going to find one and just start rolling it out to people. You know, this is our way of running our own DNS. We're going to just disable ICANN enforcement. Um, so, along with that, too, is a lot of the service is going to be run over BitTorrent. It's actually using the BitTorrent traffic itself to feed through DNS traffic and feed through all kinds of traffic. And right now, on the legal side, that happens a lot. I mean, BitTorrent's used all over the place. Uh, World of Warcraft, all updates through World of Warcraft are done through BitTorrent without your knowledge. Uh, well, unfortunately, what most people find is they have gigabytes of bandwidth being used on their machine to send updates to other people across the world. Uh, that's, I take issue with that. Don't use other people's bandwidth. Uh, Facebook, their entire back-end structure is all duplicated across the world using BitTorrent. Uh, so a lot of people are using it already to deploy code and data and stuff more than just regular files across. So after Facebook uses it, and that was kind of the prime example, they say, hey, we've got thousands of servers that all have to be running the exact same build at all times. And so if I need to push an update out here, it needs to replicate immediately to thousands of other servers. And they realize, hey, we'll just use BitTorrent. That's the best solution in place. And someone says, hey, 
That might work for DNS, because DNS is exactly the same thing. You make an update, it needs to be relayed out to everyone else immediately. Uh, so watch for that in the next few months. Client side, nice little application called PeerBlock, and this is what we track on a regular basis, because it's a service that runs on your Windows machine, this blacklist. So you have a blacklist of uh, law enforcement or anti-peer-to-peer -peer services out there, of educational institutions, of just all different kinds of different companies, uh, which if it sees any outgoing or incoming UDP or TCP packets to any of those IP addresses, it just blocks them immediately. Right, so, and it find, they, they aggressively maintain that list and they update it every two days. Uh, so what we found is even major corporations, like my webmail just stopped working one day. And after three days of troubleshooting, I realized, oh yeah, it's, it's they got big red signs all through this application of my company name showing up. Uh, so it, it does disrupt regular communications, but, and it works across the board. Any service off your machine that makes a packet incoming or outgoing runs through this and gets blacklisted. Um, just because I'm getting tired now, I've got two slides left. Actually, my voice. One last cool little thing we have to play with is, uh, is this tracker checker. The idea out there is you've got these private trackers. You've got private services out there. To get in, you must be invited in 90% of the time. However, there's little loopholes. Every now and then, they open up an open registration period, usually for a day, usually no more than a day, uh, maybe just a few hours, where they say, hey, we need fresh blood. We need more turnover. We need more eyes on our ads. So we're going to open up our open registration. And by word of mouth, it fills up. So what this application does, and you can kind of see a list down there at the bottom of some of the, uh, the trackers it tracks, is it looks at these different sites to find out when they're open for registration. And it notifies you, hey, this site's open, click here to register. And it checks basically using a regex ex expression against that page looking for keywords. If they exist, it's open. Uh, it was kind of dead in the water for a while, it just kind of sat stagnant. But then last month, the developer says, hey, I got a brand new version, I'm doing some cool stuff. It'll be out early 2011. So it's still in active development. And then, just this last fall, he had a great idea. I'll set up a Twitter account. And so instead of actually using the client, you can follow Tracker Checker, and it says, hey, this site is now open. This site's now closed. This site's now open. This site's now closed. And just track it all through Twitter to see when sites open up. He also, if you go to his website, has a, just a master list of every private tracker that he's aware of. There's hundreds of them out there. Uh, just if you want to spur your, your curiosity of what kind of content's sitting out there. Uh, spoiler alert, 80% of it's porn. But, yeah, shocker. But there's a lot of movies and just the, how people are separating stuff out and how people are separating the data into these sites. A master list out there for people to track. I'll leave it at that. I'm tired. It's getting late today. It's actually dark outside. I know we were already running late today. Um, can I take any questions for you guys? How does Peer Block compare to like Peer Guardian? Peer Block replaced Peer Guardian. Okay. Uh, so Peer Guardian is completely dead now? Peer or? Guardian is basically dead. It's, it's deprecated. And so Peer Block is the current one. Because Peer Guardian stopped working with Windows 7 Vista, I believe, at a certain point. So Block just became the new version, forked off. And that's a new one. Questions? Why don't, I, as far as this is concerned, I'm not sure if maybe there's some kind of liability issue, but as far as tracking people down who are on a particular torrent, is there anything legally complicated with joining the torrent? Now granted, you might be joining something that's contraband, or you might be right. sharing back stuff that is copyrighted material, and then in that case, you're kind of giving out the copyright so material. So is bad about joining a torrent to find out who's in that torrent? Yeah, and then just doing a net stat over and over again and just blogging everybody who connects. That's what law enforcement does. That's what these companies do. They join the torrents to see who else is on there. That's how they track them. So. You were saying that the, uh, you were saying that some of the things So, is there any beaconing or to the peers themselves? Yeah, 
file that share that file Oh, right. Well, when you, there are certain sites that actually like, oh, here, here, what So that the peers themselves are picking back their tracker, so they say, yeah, I've been, I've been on this ball for X number of months or, or days. Let me come back to that. <laughs> let, me, let me close off here as I open up to, for the next speaker, but I want to thank you guys. Uh, I'm not being uh, unallocated, but definitely. Definitely support your hacker spaces. Reverse space unallocated. Support them, give them the help they need. Uh, we appreciate Reverse Space for having us here.